Hello fellow artists and tradespersons. I am Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. We've been, you know, cooking up some ideas and we so we cobbled this show together and we don't want to disguise our intent. We're going to hammer it home and we're going to pick it apart. So join us as we navigate the use of tool proficiencies on WebDM. This episode is sponsored by Hecna from Hitpoint Press. This 5e compatible adventure and campaign setting is for levels 1 through 10 and is inspired by sideshows, circuses, and of course, campy 80s horror. Players must escape the Revelia, an extraplanar carnival created by the ringleader Hecna, filled with all manner of horrific monsters, ecstatic revelers, creepy bosses, weird science, and classic arcade games. This campaign can be played over and over using the shuffled stories engine that utilizes playing cards to generate meaningful encounters with maximum replayability. Will you see through the glamorous charade or be a rube and fall prey to Hecna's everlasting torment? Find out, y'all. To back this Kickstarter, go to Hecna.com or follow the link in the description. All right, Jim, let's talk about tool proficiencies. I think yeah. that they're better at bridges than they are verses. Mm. Wait. Sure. Oh, I mean, but it... <laughs> wait, I'm sorry. What are tool proficiencies, Jim, in this edition of D&D that we uh, are playing right now? The current edition of the world's uh, most popular fantasy game. An element of fifth edition that I find really interesting and really a fascinating element of play that mm -hmm. I don't really, outside of Xanathar's, I don't really see developed at all. Well, okay. um, you know, <laughs> the uh, the player's handbook and DMG are, you know, they have very little to say about tool proficiencies other than they can be added to an ability check that, um, you know, features the tool use in some way mm -hmm. or is immediately related to that tool use. Um, uh, and I then, mean, you know, the DMG lists maybe, a, you know, example of like woodworkers tools being dex, int, or, or strength based on what you're trying to do with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I found that the <laughs> advice in the PHB and the DMG kind of contradict each other in terms of like when you would actually roll. Um, but, you know, they're, they're still in the sort of same ballpark. To me, the two questions that come out when we're looking at, at the rules of fifth edition are like, when do you apply a tool proficiency as opposed to a skill proficiency? Because mm -hmm. there are some weird overlap between them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then what ability to use whenever you're, you're making that roll. And so for the first one, like, when is it a tool proficiency versus a skill proficiency? This is where I think that um, the using the abilities section of, uh, the, of the adventuring part of the PHP is really helpful in this. Like, I used to always think like, okay, like, when is my musical instrument proficiency used as opposed to my perform? The question that I think I'll see a lot of people ask is, and certainly ask us at WebDM is like, when do I roll musical instruments versus perform. This is an easy one for me. And you look at the perform skill and it's like anytime you are doing something to entertain others, you're going to roll this skill. And there's plenty of times you might play a musical instrument and the purpose is not to entertain. The purpose is to show technical proficiency or to demonstrate a kind of an ability to play music that is not there for pure entertainment purposes. Now, obviously there's overlap, you know, later on we get some guidance on what that might look like. But similarly for like the disguise kit versus deception, like disguise kit is there to craft a disguise, to apply it. But once it's applied, you still have to successfully deceive, <laughs> you know, the mm -hmm. individuals who are, uh, you're, you're attempting to uh, deceive. The other one that I see a lot of is sleight of hand versus thieves tools. And this is one that really leaves me scratching my head. Like I can understand some of the others, especially perform in musical instrument, because there is a lot of overlap, especially in the bard musical instruments as a spell focus, but a lot of their abilities are about inspiration and entertainment. So I understand why sleight of hand is one of those where there's no ambiguity at all in sleight of hand. It's like, it's the act of picking someone's pocket, putting something in a pocket or like doing m simple magic tricks, right? Like making coins disappear, pulling them out of your ear or something, you know, dexterity as a general skill mentions picking locks, disarming traps, that kind of thing. But there's nothing about sleight of hand that seems to imply to me that you would use it as a substitute for thieves tools. But it does raise the question of like, if a dexterity check can open a lock or disarm a complicated mechanical trap, what do you need the tool for? Like, can anyone attempt this 
without mm-hmm. a tool? Can you make that check without one? Can you, you know, attempt to use a tool without the proficiency? Of course, in, in a, the grand tradition of fifth edition, the answer to that is maybe. <laughs> Ask your DM. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and that's I can't have all the answers. They give you. <laughs> right, you can't. You can't expect a rule book to have all the answers and then be manageable. But reading through those abilities, what is a strength? When you make a strength check, what are you doing? Not not like the way that they outline the skills afterwards, but like the actual just making a raw strength check, making dexterity, intelligence, whatever. Like that is the rubric that I would use if the player's attempting to use a skill. You know, if, if is what they're trying to do with that skill about fine manipulation or detail, maybe that's it. Maybe it's dex. Yeah. Is it about just sort of like endurance or brute strength, <laughs> strength or con? We don't know yet. And if it's like creativity, I kind of see it as wisdom. I really have a tough time seeing when you would use charisma for a tool proficiency. And I'm not buying all the people who are like, painter's tools, it's about charisma. It's like, no, no, no. There's plenty of artists who have no charisma that can make beautiful art. Yeah, <laughs> you know, well, really... uh, yeah, it's very true. <laughs> I would say the, the couple of examples I would give for charisma with tools yeah. would be either Bob Ross, because okay. that yes. is yeah. pure charisma. Certainly using the tool and showing like, oh, that's not an accident. That's a happy little, what, you know, it's a way of, of, of engaging with the viewer, which is what yeah. charisma is to me. Yes. It's a yeah. way of bringing people in, but also like those people that like paint paintings upside down at like half times of, of sporting events oh. and oh, they do sure. it in yeah. like two minutes and everybody's mm-hmm. like, what are they doing? What are they doing? And then they go, right. Boom, and you're like, oh. yeah. yeah, no, performance art, certainly. And in that sense, like, say, a Bob Ross, to me, that's a, a painting tool check with, with some kind of bonus for perform, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's, or just having a high charisma. And that leads us nicely into Xanathar's because Xanathar's answers a lot of these questions mm-hmm. and provides you, appropriately enough, a solid set of tools <laughs> to uh, determine when you use those proficiencies. It's definitely needed, <laughs> you know, by the time uh, XGE or XGE came out. Like one of the things that Xanathar's does now that we're on the subject to provide a secondary segue back to it Ooh, is yeah. say athletics, a strength athletics check to open a door. Well, that's one thing, but if you have a crowbar, which is a tool, it gives you advantage on that roll. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then Xanathars and if, comes along and says, if you have proficiency in this and the tool, you now have advantage on the roll. And yeah. so I, I like that they at least, I don't know if it was on purpose or if that's just kind of the way the rules work and it, mm-hmm. it naturally led to that evolution. I like that they at least illuminated that little that little thing from crowbar yeah. and it's like no that's how it should work because it makes sense yeah. if you if you have performance and the tool or whatever in the tool yeah that's that simple thing of like you have proficiency in both then that is worth at least advantage mm-hmm. you know and and there's a lot of situations i can think of where it's like yeah strength and then you take it from crowbar to just any of the carpenter's tools Mm-hmm. Right, like I'm just proficient in carpentry. I know where this door is going to be weakest. I know where to, you know, take it apart. Or, you know, Mason's tools, which is like, give me a minute, I'll take apart this dungeon wall. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And when you start thinking of it like that, we start combining tool and skill proficiencies. There's a lot of a lot of depth there, and a lot of opportunities to not just like get a mechanical benefit but to showcase something your character is good at, usually something about their background or, or some kind of very technical skill, mm-hmm. you know, not skill skill, but you know, small s skill that they have that, <laughs> that differentiate, differentiates them from someone else. That's just one way, right? Like they got the other, they have the other uh, option, which is if you've got a skill and a tool proficiency that maybe fit the same task, you know, maybe that you just get more from that success. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't necessarily get advantage or something like that. You might even just automatically succeed, which is how I use a lot of them. It's like, oh, you got a skill and a tool proficiency that fits. Yeah, you don't, we don't need to roll for this. But you can get, like, more information out of it. So, like, you know, this is pretty common in all of the examples they give. But it's like if you're investigating something, if you're, like, looking for fine detail, if you know something about the thing you are trying to investigate, you're going to get more information from that. Mm-hmm. You know, are you looking for a secret door somewhere? Well, you, if you have Mason's tools or Carpenter's tools or something, you're going to get more information about that. Not only do you find the door, but you know how it opens. And that's just sort of one example. It could be mm-hmm. alchemist tools and, and, you know, tracing chemicals or something like that. One of my favorites is uh, either if you have either, say, calligraphy tools or navigator's tools and, say, arcana or history, and you're trying to decipher an ancient map that you mm-hmm. don't really mm-hmm. know the language 
but yeah. you at least understand like the notations made on maps that let yeah. you get, that gives you enough context clues to at least use the map and get something out of it. One of the things that prompted this, this particular show is like a lot of people asking us like, how in the world do you use tools in adventures? And like going mm -hmm. over the sorts of things that Xanathar's recommends and just how I would run them, I see a lot of, a lot of instances where th this is little stuff. You're not basing an entire adventure around this, but if, if there's a way to include like a clue or a lead or some extra secret bit of information, try to find a way to have a tool related to that. And so whether it's like cartography and navigators tools or calligraphy and cartography, which share some similarities or gaming set, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that you, you use your dragon chess proficiency to play a game with an NPC in yeah. order to learn more about them, you mm -hmm. know, those are moments that, um, you know, you're not going to hang an entire adventure on, but you can like really shine a spotlight on a character and let them, you know, have a moment of, of feeling important and influential yeah. uh, to the larger sort of scheme of it. They go through each tool, kit, musical instrument, vehicle, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Like anything you would add that's a, a non-skill ability proficiency <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and tell you what are the components of it? What actual physical objects comprise this kit? What skills might benefit from having this proficiency or that you might get an extra benefit from? What's the special use of this particular kit? Obvious example would be crafting alchemical items smoke bombs and, and the like from uh, alchemist tools and then the final they give you some sample dcs so that you have an idea of you know how difficult is it to accomplish these things and if you haven't read those if you're kind of curious or you're just you know it's been a while especially if you're a player it's it's in the dm's tools section of xanathar's but if you're a player it's worth looking that up because you might not be aware of everything that your tool proficiency is capable of and i think there's the big ones like you know, thieves tools or cooking utensils, which apparently come up a lot now um, <laughs> that you can sort of uh, sort of it's obvious what you can do. Yeah, yeah. But you might not know that, say, if you're a cobbler, you can <laughs> craft hidden compartments inside your your footwear. And I'd also argue that cobbler is probably the most important adventuring skill, even though probably nobody's ever going to roll it because you need your footwear. You know? Yeah, you Just need your footwear and, and, and making a cleric cobbler is the best because you're all about the souls. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I realized I just said earlier, I said calligraphy tools or navigators, I meant cartographers, but I think you, oh, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. you corrected it. Correct, yeah. <laughs> there is overlap between cartography and calligraphy and, and Xanathar's though. Like they both yeah. are involved in making fake maps and, and deciphering maps and the like. So, mm -hmm. And they both start C, come on, man. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There are some tools that aren't going to get used very much, potter's tools or weavers, but you might have a situation where you know, a certain type of pottery is culturally important to mm -hmm. a region and having someone that just happens to have potter's tools proficiency from a guild artisan background will give them that little bit of edge. They're like, oh, is that a, a vase from the 17th dynasty? Like, that's really rare. You know, look at that urn over there. You know, yeah. you know urns are used in this capacity by the elves, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> And Ten gold. That's my. That's my. That's my top offer. That's my. Could tell by the cross hatching. Anyway, this puts a lot of, of of onus on the player though, and it's up to them to really look for ways to apply this uh, this very niche, unique proficiency that they've got in ways that are relevant to the adventure. Now, the corresponding sort of onus <laughs> is for the DM to be open to that mm -hmm. and, and to allow for creative use of these things. Because otherwise they just sit in your character sheet, never being used, it, it, it affects nothing. Or only you know. being used in downtime. And it's just it's right. just narrated through. Yeah. Speaking of which, it's interesting. You don't ever have to make a role to craft something. You just need the tools, materials, and time. So it's like one of the most common things that you might think you're going to roll your tool proficiency for, which is to make something. Nah, it's fine. You know, you, you do it. You do, a th you do the thing. You know, you mm -hmm. earn your upkeep, that kind of thing. To make it come to the forefront, I think that you really do have to work towards finding uses for these things. And okay. And you know what I mean? Yo, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Well, no, I was just, uh, I was getting ready to segue into the next, uh, oh, well, next segment uh, of just when are we supposed to use these things, Jim? Like, uh, it's, it's the player, they know what they can use these for, but the DM has to incorporate them into the adventure, or at least yep. allow for their incorporation. And uh, so what, what, what was, what's some guidelines that you would say? 
I think that when you start looking at tool proficiencies, there's a common theme that emerges, and that is these are useful in social and exploration-based you know, encounters or adventures. And that's kind of appropriate, right? That in that sense, they share a, a commonality with skills and that they're usually used in non-combat situations. That's kind of because we already have a robust toolkit for <laughs> adjudicating combat in Dungeons and Dragons, you know? There's plenty of options we have available there. Looking at the sorts of situations the tool might be useful in, the, the common themes that emerge are like searching something, examining something, identifying mm -hmm. something, gaining some kind of special insight because of those actions. Um, they can be useful in, in NPC interactions mm -hmm. uh, or even just like contests of some kind. And I can imagine there being a, a sculpting contest or, you know, a, a three dragon ante tournament at your local tavern. Those are social and exploration based encounters, leaving the door open for the possibility that your tools might be useful here. Right. beyond just the obvious ones right that those are the moments that you can you know that you can look for and go like you know what i got this tool proficiency i haven't done anything with <laughs> you know would, wouldn't this be useful here wouldn't my calligrapher's tools be useful if we're trying to write a request to the high priest for something mm -hmm. you know make sure that it's well pinned that it's legible uh, again as someone who spent a lot of time reading <laughs> reading books from five to six hundred years ago it's really hard to read people's handwriting from five to six hundred years ago. It's hard to read people's handwriting who wrote something for you five minutes ago, you know, in a hurry or something. So hey, having, you ever you nice. ever try to read a doctor's handwriting? It's oh god, yeah, yeah. No, that's the we use the decipher skill every day in the pharmacy. Trust me. You're damn right you do. You're damn right. Those are the moments that you want to. Do you want to create an illuminated manuscript uh, of a spell book as a gift? to someone. That sounds like there's painter's tools and calligraphy that are going to be useful in that. They're small moments and, and to break them down further for ones that say involve uh, social encounters or intrigue I'm thinking, you know, yeah, calligrapher's tools mm -hmm. is going to be useful here. Perhaps writing the act of writing itself. It's a literary culture you're a part of and beautiful writing, writing that conforms to a certain standard or form may be important if you can't nail that if you if you put me if you put a sloppy scroll in front of me i'm not going to read it it clearly shows you're uneducated you have nothing you have nothing i could benefit from from this exchange you know that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here it requires an attention to detail on the dm's part or at least you know openness for the player suggestion but th you know, this is where they're going to be useful cooking obviously one for social interaction and entry mm -hmm. right like cooking <laughs> it's you know for a long time is a communal activity right same with like brewers supplies oh most, um, most definitely what about using your calligraphy tools along with deception to hide a cipher in a note like maybe yeah. every word that's misspelled the correct letter that you misspelled with is the the letter that you need to unlock this yeah. you know something like that right yeah yeah um, absolutely yeah and, and I think like pairing up tool proficiencies as well, like forger's kit or forgery kit and calligrapher's tools, like you can, I don't know, <laughs> you're pretty much guaranteed that you can fake any kind of writing that someone might want to pass off. Like mm -hmm. say a notice from the monarch to let someone out of jail because they've been pardoned. Yeah. Or request for more funds from the Iron Bank. I don't know. He just felt like it was a generous move. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, those kinds of things are going to be really important. Disguise kits for passing yourself off as someone else. Uh, you know, the use of, say, musical instruments or gaming sets to provide a justification for a type of social encounter or to enhance a certain social encounter that you're in. You know, you could do painting as one. You know, you're, you are a painter looking for a patron to sort of like fund your art. What they don't realize is that you're gonna really use that money to fund your adventuring, but you still have to put out something to maintain that fiction. Oh um, yeah. And then obviously poisoning and thieves tools for intrigue based games. You know, like someone who's proficient in cooking utensils and poisoning, like you gotta watch out, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially if they also round it out with an herbalism kit proficiency. It's like- Oh yeah, if they, if they <laughs> recommend you should really try every course Right. And you, you know, like, no, you better try every course because if you don't get every element from every dish, then you get yeah. poisoned. Yeah, no, that's that's a fun puzzle. It's like, yeah, everybody who finished is fine, but 
this person left early and now they're they're gone. <laughs> yeah. um, you know that your mark is a picky eater, so that's it's <laughs> right. as easy as that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody else is fine. For more exploration based, uh, uh, you know, challenges or combat, there's obviously cartography, looking at a map. Where is this place on the map? Can we navigate this region based mm -hmm. on what we know about it? Oh yeah, I've heard about this place. Let me go dig up an old map or you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I mean, or like, it's reading reading an old map but having history to put along with those cartography yes. tools so that you know how it's changed over the eras so you yeah. know what you're looking at things like absolutely. that. absolutely absolutely i mean think of like sort of the ur fantasy text that D D is sort of based on the hobbit mm -hmm. and it's like how much of the <clears throat> hobbit is based around these dwarves have a map that yeah. they need to get deciphered yeah. so that they could travel someplace using the map to get to their treasure where there's going to be a dragon mm -hmm. like come on it, it starts with the cartography uh, and those are the sorts of things that you can use, like, you know, whether it's like herbalism. All right, we, we need this special herb. We need one that only grows in this location. We need the resurrection plant. Oops, <laughs> we didn't quite realize what it would do when we used it. You know, land and water vehicles is another one, you know, that could see use in exploration challenges, right? Like a wagon chase. Through, through a forest where the wheels are coming off and you're having to deal with like multiple either horse riders or someone in a chariot. Yes, I love Willow. It's the best chase scene ever. Just deal with it. And right. it's, a good, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's coupling like your survival, your animal handling and your, your land-based vehicles so you can win that race. Oh yeah, if you're proficient in animal handling and land vehicles, then yeah, you're probably a better charioteer. Mm -hmm. than someone that just has either one of those. And then obviously thieves tools, useful in exploration, disarming devices, uh, opening locks, that kind of thing. Uh, setting traps, right? That's another one that, uh, that thieves tools covers. And I like tinkerers tools because they're just kind of a catch all grab bag. You know, you got a lot of things in there, you can do a lot of different things, you know. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I would, well, the thing is about tinkerers tools, I would allow people to do a lot of little things from maybe other tool proficiencies. Like uh -huh. you don't know how to make armor, but you can use your tinkerers tools to repair someone's armor, right? Yeah. Just yeah. to, oh, you know, got a buckle that busted loose? Come here, bring it over here, you know? Yeah. Things yeah. like that. Some folks might say, well, armor, my armor never gets damaged or there's never, never a reason to repair. And anyway, we've got mending. Like number one, that's armor degrades as much as your DM wants it to. And if we're talking about like our other skill show, we're talking about skill challenges, damage to equipment might be a cost for a failure. You know, it could just be that like, yeah, this rope was busted. Oh shit, it's our only rope. So someone's gonna fix it. Or like you're saying, a buckle on your armor has, uh, you know, is, is has worn off or not working right. So, you know, you're not gonna gain the full benefit of that armor. Maybe not as much of dexterity bonus as you would otherwise get. Uh, or something like that, or one AC less mm -hmm. because it's not fitting right. These aren't like big, useful tools in a variety of situations. They're not spells. They are moments that you can either enhance because you have one of these proficiencies or the dungeon master can leverage against you because you don't and make something more complicated because you don't have one of these. But the last one, the last category that I can think of for like uses for tools is entirely hijink based. It's about creating shenanigans, engaging in monkey shines. Like there's all kinds of things you can do to get in trouble and to just execute a wacky plan or an outlandish mm -hmm. plan that you might not otherwise think about. And these are things like carpenter's tools so that you can build shit, take shit down, <laughs> know where exactly that, you know, you know, a wooden structure you would need to target to either reinforce it or to demolish it. Alchemy is obviously another one creating all kinds of greases and sticky substances, acids and the like. It's a, a tool that creates other tools. Uh, a forgery kit to like, oh, the so-and-so wanted us to, you know, the high priest wanted us to recover this ancient relic for them. Uh, like we'd rather keep it for ourselves and, and create a, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a very perfect facsimile of it uh, using our forgery kit and a little judicious use of magic and, and our rogue's high deception to uh, pass it off. You know, we're not going to give them the real thing. Come on, that's a magic item. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, and similar to say uh, carpenter's tools, masons and smith tools, uh, anything that lets you make a thing, especially a structure, there's so many fun things you can do with those tool proficiencies in, dem in, in demolishing something. Mm -hmm. You know, dungeons are made of stone. Uh, you know, <laughs> I know that we've, we've talked about before on, uh, you know, just sort of creative problem solving. Instead of dealing with a locked door, go through the wall. 
You mm -hmm. know, dig your own tunnels, dig your way out of a collapse tunnel, set a collapse ceiling yourself, dig your own pit traps. Once you start thinking in these terms and start thinking of tools as problem solving devices or problem creating devices for your enemies, there's all kinds of things that start to emerge. And one of the things that Xanathars does really well is by telling you what's exactly in that kit, you can start going like, okay, well, I'm gonna use my shovel from this and my, you know, my pick from over here. Oh, you've got a, a kit for this. Like, doesn't that have files in it or chisels or something like that? Tools are one of the greatest thing, you know, things that, that humankind possesses. <laughs> you know, well, one of the- It's the what sets us apart that, from the animals, I mean. A handful of other animals that use tools. So mm -hmm. to not highlight them, it's same with languages, right? Like oh, yeah. with languages, come on. But to not highlight them, to not allow them to benefit you and influence the decisions that you have, like that's something that you're leaving on the table. You're just, mm -hmm. you're just let, it's just sitting there you, you, mm -hmm. you, to do something with. An example from our, one of our recent games, right? Trolls are across a bridge, don't necessarily want to tussle with four trolls at fourth level. What are they going to need to get past? They're hungry. Well, what can we do? Can we fish? Can we give them some food? Who's got fishing rods? Well, my guy does, because he's carrying like 80 pounds of gear. This is a giant bugbear. And I just look through the thing. All right, we might need fishing lines. We might need hooks. We might need a grappling hook. Might need shovels. Might need whatever. I took those for the, with the explicit purpose of causing shenanigans. Mm -hmm. of just having a tool that I, yep, I got one of those. I carry it around in a big sack. <laughs> And it's the only thing he carries around, you know, with the knowledge that these aren't just going to be on my character sheet to fill up space. They're there because I anticipate problems that these tools will solve. I've come around in my thinking in terms of like Dungeons and Dragons and the role of magic and, and sometimes mundane magic. And I've really, really turned against the idea of magic that replaces a tool. Yeah, cantrips are at will, whatever, but like my my sewing needle and thread doesn't have to worry about dispels or counter counter spells or needing to concentrate or anti-magic fields like it just works because it's a physical thing mm -hmm. and like i don't need to spend years studying it or something i just you know i'm gonna mend my shit over here real quick no i don't need a cantrip that does it i i don't need magic for this what a poor use of magic yeah, to, I, you know. <laughs> oh no, I was I, I grappled with taking mending with my artificer because I yeah. the artificer gives you so many tools that yeah. it's just kind of like well if I just have all these tools that I would just use those as opposed to wasting a cantrip on mending which is just like right. an auto thing because why would yeah. you have one if you have all these others I don't know but another yeah. uh, another example uh, from from popular media it wasn't popular when it came out but whatever uh, <laughs> one of our favorite movies the Thirteenth Warrior where they're yes. getting the town ready for an invasion and you have yeah. all these people digging ditches, making sp spike traps and pit yep. traps. Uh, and then you have the scene where he's got to do this thing with a sword and he can't, so they have to go over to the blacksmithing tool and reforge his sword. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. like, there's just so much at an, as, as an example of just like yeah. different ways that you can do this. Yeah, 13th Warrior is one of the best D&D movies out there. <laughs> Ever. Um, hands down. In my mind, having studied as much of ancient history as I have and looked at it, like to me, the entrenching tool is, a, is what sets apart certain soldiers from others. Romans are one of these, you know, armies and sort of military cultures that excelled at using the entrenching tool, picks, shovels and the like, as a weapon, creating mm -hmm. their own battlements, create, you know, building bridges in a day, creating yeah. the roads, like these impressive feats of engineering, of battlefield engineering, of creating earthworks and field fortifications and the like, that set them apart from other armies of their time, other militaries of their time, because it elevated what they could do. They were able to bring to bear all this manpower and the expertise needed uh, to, uh, you know, to make it useful. And I mean, in that sense is an example of how people have used tools you know for all kinds of things mm -hmm. and like it then seems once i start thinking about it it then seems really weird <laughs> that um that dnd &D doesn't feature this more and and of course the kind of uh retro style dnd &D that i like where you don't really have skills you have very few abilities it's all about what you can think of uh it's a lot of times it's about your gear mm -hmm. this i mean the, the tool proficiency appeals to that side of me yeah because i'm like oh yeah uh, I, I definitely want to learn how to use these things or, or make use of them in a game. I think it's a very, very compelling use of, of uh, 
of tools, even if it doesn't seem obvious at first. Most definitely, Jim. I really do think you just hit the nail on the head. Ooh. <laughs> if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. So I got like a hair up my nose. <laughs> it happens to everyone, Jim. It happens. <clears throat> There's like a tool like, proficiency that you can use to get rid of that. Proficiency. <laughs> That's called a fingernail. Uh, <laughs> there's a. Uh, well, see, that's your that's your dexterity. No. That's your dexterity. I'm oh, sorry. I'll oh, yeah. shut up. <laughs> I don't have a, some some nose scissors. Um, <laughs>